Good morning and welcome to DEC Online. I'm here again with Ross this morning. Good morning, Ross. You all right? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. I'm doing pretty good. We, um, we forgot Mother's Day last week. Well, I didn't. It was a bit my, my mom's present arrived nice and early. Yeah, that, but we forgot when we were recording. And so, um, yeah, thanks to Ben for putting up the, uh, the bit about all the mothers. Uh, so a belated Mother's Day to all the mothers in the church. Uh, and uh, so I'm wearing green this week because it's um, celebrating uh, St. Patrick's Day, which has just gone, mm-hmm. and uh, being Irish. So, yeah, and I've even got a bit of um, orange there as well. <laughs> yeah, I've got blue on underneath for his Italian heritage <laughs> and red socks on for his, for his Welsh heritage. <laughs> so anyway, and, and later on in the service, I'm going to be telling a story about, about an Irish hero, um, somebody who's largely forgotten but I think uh, hopefully that you'll find it helpful when we come to that. So we're going to start off this morning uh, with a worship song, and um, it's, it's not a new one, uh, it's a bit older, Revelation song, but it's a great song, so uh, worship with us as we uh, sing this together.
So I really, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy that, that uh, song, Worshipping Together. We're hoping to record some new songs for Easter if we can uh, manage to do it. So this morning, Ross, we come to Mind Matters. And uh, you, this is going to be the last one, and then you're going to take a break. Mm -hmm. um, but you're going to be speaking next week anyway. And um, so, um, yeah, what are you going to be talking about? So, well, let me yeah, go with that. Well, just go for it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So at the beginning or the end of most of these uh, recordings, we've prefixed them or ended them with a suggestion that if you're struggling in a particular way, we'd encourage you to maybe seek out some specialised help. If what you're struggling with is not resolvable by yourself or through dialogue with a friend um, or whatever else um, you have tried to do. And so for many, the idea of going to counselling or for some therapy can be still a little bit of a strange concept. and people maybe don't really know what to expect. Perhaps that's because in Ireland for so long, therapy was maybe seen as an American thing or it didn't really happen here. Or we maybe have images of it from the movies where people were lying backwards on a couch and that just seemed a little bit strange. So I thought what may be helpful for people if it's something that you have been considering, if it's something that you've been thinking about, but you're not really sure what to expect, um, I thought I'd throw together a few things that may be really helpful for you to think about. I know that whenever I went for therapy, maybe about 10 years ago now for some counselling for an issue that I couldn't resolve by myself, I didn't really know what to expect. And I think if I'd have known some of these things, it may have helped me as I took that step in. So I thought what I would do is throw together a few little pointers or a few little things for you to think about if you are considering taking a step to go and help, get some help for something that you're struggling with. The first thing that I would say is, have an idea of what it is that you want to talk about. Have an idea, idea of what it is you want to experience and get from your time in counselling. We can need to go to counselling and need to go to therapy for a number of different reasons. Maybe depression, low mood, anxiety, trauma, um, perhaps there's relationship issues. There's a whole array of different things that we may be struggling with. And so what's really maybe quite helpful is to have an idea of what it is that you would like to get from your time. And that will help with the second thing that I'm going to suggest. And that second thing is, is that go and have a look for a therapist that has a level of expertise in the area that you may be wanting to work through. There's lots of different counsellors out there, um, but not all counsellors are specialised in particular areas. And so it's really important to make sure that the thing that you want to go and talk about is something that that therapist is comfortable in dealing with and has expertise in dealing with as well. So that's really good for you to think about too. And you can check that out through a number of different ways. One is that you can look online uh, or you can give them a call or perhaps you might even kind of give a well-known uh, counselling centre a call and they can put you in connection with a good therapist. The next thing that I would suggest is make sure that the therapist that you are thinking about going to see is properly qualified. Now, currently in Ireland, it is satisfactory for a therapist to practice with a diploma, and that's going to change, but at the minute, that is okay. But what I would suggest is ensure that the therapist is qualified at least to degree level, and maybe even to a master's level as well. The reason for this is, is that you know that they've gone through some really good, rigorous training, and it shows that they're also committed to theoretical underpinnings um, of the practice too. The next thing I would suggest is that once you make contact with them, um, ask some questions about practicalities. Ask them about their location. Ask them about their availability. Ask them how long sessions will last. Ask them if their property is satisfactory for you to be able to, to, to attend. Ask if they have good COVID regulations and procedures in place. Ask them about costs. Ask as many questions as you want because it's really important that you feel comfortable going in to some counselling. So feel free to ask those questions. Another thing to consider is these are all good questions to ask whenever you are perhaps looking for a private therapist. But also have a look and see if there are any schemes that you are able to avail of. Perhaps you're a college student, and I know that a lot of colleges, what they do is that they have um, free counselling resources within college. Uh, and so why don't you check that out if you're a student? If you're an employee of a big, uh, in, in a fairly well-known and big company, quite often they will also have the availability through EAP schemes to be able to avail of some counselling there as well. 
If you're a medical card holder, and many people don't know this, if you're a medical card holder, you're also entitled to some free sessions through the EHSC as well, and you can be referred to those through uh, your GP. So have a look around and see if there are some options that may also help suit you in a financial way as well. The last thing that I would say for you to really consider is that if you decide to go for some therapy, be prepared for the fact that therapy is work. Therapy is not necessarily an easy thing. And so your therapist may suggest things for you to do away from the session. And those things are really important. Good therapy outcomes have been shown to correlate with work being done away from the session. In fact, evidence points to two major contributing factors. One is work that you do away from the session. And two is the alliance between the therapist and the client, that that is a good, strong alliance. And so one thing that I would say to you is that if you do go for counselling and perhaps it just doesn't quite fit, don't lose hope continue the search, you'll find the right therapist for you if it is something that you need. So if that's you, if those are things that you, or if therapy is something that you've been considering for a while, um, I would really encourage you to consider those things as you perhaps take that step forward if it's something that you feel you need to do. So thanks for that, Ross. Yeah, I think it's really important, isn't it? To, I, I, I think the important, you know, of trying to find the right person that you can connect with or whatever is, is important, you know, and uh, that you trust. It's the same in any medical field, isn't it? Like, you know, that um, if you're paying your toe, you go to the toe doctor. And, um, yeah, that we can't know, you know, none of us know everything or we're not expert in every area of life, you know. But I, I do think, I, I think back to what Charlie McAsee said at that conference we were at in London some years ago when he said um, one of the greatest lessons he'd learned in his life was to say when he wasn't okay, mm -hmm. that it was okay to ask for help. Yeah. And I think that's really important, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think sometimes if we, if, if we do take that step, um, it's really, really new for us. Um, and it's okay to feel a little bit apprehensive about, ab course. about making that step. Um, but good therapists and good counselors will be really aware that you're feeling that way and they'll do the best to kind of help you ease yeah. into, the, into the process. I think the younger generations find it easier, you know? Mm. Certainly people of my generation and the older generation uh, I'm much more likely to, you know, ah, oh, sure, I'm grand, or I'll just muddle through and I'll be, I'll be okay, you know. But there does come a time when you're not doing okay. Mm -hmm. And um, knowing the difference, I suppose, sometimes is, uh, is not that easy. Yeah. So thanks for that. Really appreciate it. And um, you're going to take a break for a week. You're going to be preaching. And then um, what are you going to do after that? Yeah, so I thought what may be, may be really helpful is that we've looked at a lot of um, maybe practical things. So right back at the start, we looked at kind of some of the behavioural activation that may help us. And we looked at um, perhaps making sure that we're engaging with people. Um, but a lot of, uh, I suppose, areas in this, in this field would point towards a lot of our distress can come from our thinking uh, and can come from our thoughts. Uh, and so what I'll do for the next little while is I'll do a little series on perhaps common um, dodgy thinking patterns uh, that can get us into a place where we're maybe not feeling so good to be aware of what they are and maybe how to go about challenging those as well. Excellent. Dodgy thinking patterns. You'll only find it here on DEC.ie. Thanks. You're welcome. And it's back to Ross for the kids slot. Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you're OK. I hope you are doing well back at school. I'm sure you're really happy to be back seeing your friends um, and just not having to do so much work at home. So I hope it's been going good. I hope you're enjoying being back. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy and have always really enjoyed is wildlife. I really enjoy watching animals. And quite often I would find myself watching some programs on the TV <clears throat> about animals, or even sometimes just going on YouTube and like looking at animals. I remember looking at like animals fighting and stuff like that there. And just how they survive in the wild always really interested me. And one animal that has always just really sort of like interested me, but kind of grossed me out a little bit as well are snakes. I find them just like really creepy and really weird, but I also find them pretty cool. Like the fact that they have no legs, but yet they move. Brilliant. I love the way they just slither on their bellies across the ground and some of them move really, really fast. I love the way they kind of like use their tongues to just like figure out what is going on around them. Their tongues are so sensitive that they pick up on all these different things and, and, and they taste the air and when they taste the air, it kind of lets them know what's around them. 
I just think that's really fascinating and really, really cool. And I love the way like they eat their food. Like it's kind of gross, but it's just like they wrap their mouths around it and then they just swallow the whole thing. It's like crazy. Don't try that at home because it's not good for us. But one of the things that I also find really, really class, but also kind of gross, is the fact that they shed their skin. Watch this. kind of gross, but it's also really, really cool. Now, the reason that a snake will shed its skin is because, well, it just doesn't fit it anymore. It's outgrown it, so their body has become too big for the skin that they are in, and so they have to get rid of it. They have to take it off. It's kind of like whenever you grow and your trousers don't fit you anymore and you have to get a new pair. The old trousers, well, they're no good anymore. They don't fit you and you need to get some new ones and you need to put it on. We've been looking at the book of Ephesians or the letter of Ephesians that I should say over on Right Now Media. And it's all about God's plan for us as believers. And the next section over on Right Now Media is a little bit like the snake shedding its skin or us having to change our trousers. Paul tells us that when we become believers, there are some things from our life that we have to put off because, well, we're different. We've grown in a different direction, in a different way. A little bit like the snake has outgrown its skin. When we become followers of Jesus, there are things that we have to like put behind us. There are things that we have to take off and new things that we have to put on. Some habits, some things that we may have done in the past, they don't really fit in our new life with Jesus anymore. So today, when at some point with your family, when you get the chance, why don't you hop over onto Right Now Media so Phil can explain this part of Ephesians to you. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you're enjoying working through the letter of Ephesians together. So um, this morning is our last talk uh, from Corinthians on uh, spiritual maturity for a couple of weeks as we have Easter coming up next week. Ross is going to talk uh, on Palm Sunday and the week after then is Easter Sunday. And then we'll be back the Sunday after that uh, talking about uh, Corinthians. So in the last talk uh, that uh, I gave in this, uh, Paul, we, we looked at how Paul... Um, was saying that he was entitled to various things as an apostle, but he refused to accept them because he was so dedicated to preaching uh, the gospel. And one of, this idea, one of the ideas that uh, Paul talked about at the time, and, and right through, is, is about denying yourself uh, in relation to your walk with Christ. And Corinth, we know at the time, was a beautiful city. I watched a documentary on the TV the other day about it. Absolutely fantastic city, a beautiful place to be, and a place of pleasure. The Corinthians were really dedicated to pleasure, and um, even people went there on holiday. And, uh, and therefore, Paula talks about this change in being a believer where you're not dedicated to pleasure, but dedicated to the pursuit of God. And it comes in all aspects of daily life. He talks about marriage and about sexual morality, disputes between people, leadership. And, you know, you, you see that in a lot of what he's saying, he reflects that peak that Jesus got to in the Sermon on the Mount, which is love others as you love yourself. Treat everyone as you want, it to, as you want to be treated. And it's not just a nice idea, you know. I think often... We've heard that repeated, oh, love each other as you'd like to be loved, as you love yourself, and treat others as you'd like to be treated. And it can just seem like a kind of a nice idea or even sometimes even a trite thing to say. But actually, it requires self-denial. It requires a whole way of life that is quite different to maybe other things that we hear. And so now we come to the end of chapter 9, and there's two sections in it, which we'll take uh, one at a time, uh, where Paul just basically continues on the theme. 
So here we go. So this is the last section of chapter 9, and we're going to start reading from uh, 19 to 23. So here we go. And I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people who bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of, God, of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I find, try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. And so Paul here is talking about taking on the mantle of Jesus. And maybe the, the um, example of Jesus that we can most readily go to is the one of washing his disciples' feet, where Jesus takes on the lowliest task of the lowliest servant, um, and he shows his disciples what it means really to be a leader and to be a servant, is to take on these tasks so that you don't elevate yourself, that you're not putting yourself up, as it were, at the top of the table, but instead doing the lowliest task. And what free man would declare himself a slave? But that's what Paul does here. In fact, it would have been a pretty shameful thing to do. People were proud of being free, and slaves were considered really, even though maybe up to a third of the population were uh, slaves of some sort or another. Um, obviously, the freed people considered themselves to be considerably above slaves. And yet Paul says, I have become a slave to bring many to Christ. And he explains that he becomes a Jew to the Jews. Well, you'd say, how, how can you do that? Sure, he was already a Jew, and he lived as a Jew all his life, and he followed all their customs. What he really means here is that he... He followed the Jewish customs and continued to follow them when he was living with the Jews so that he would not be unhindered in spreading the gospel to them. And even though he felt free not to follow the whole Jewish law anymore, he still did it when he was with the Jews so that he wouldn't offend them and so that he wouldn't be unhindered in sharing the gospel. Maybe a good example uh, to talk about this is uh, we read in Acts 15 that Paul uh, had Timothy, who was a Greek and a Gentile, uh, who would have been uncircumcised, that he had him circumcised so he could bring him with him uh, among the Jewish people when he was ministering to them. Now, that goes, in, it seems to go against so much of what Paul had already written about and talked about and, he, and the arguments that had gone on about fulfilling the Jewish law, and particularly in his writings to the Gentiles, where he say, or to the Galatians, where he says that circumcision is nothing. And he became very heated with the Judaizers. But the reason that he became heated with them was that they said circumcision and following the law was necessary for salvation. And he absolutely refuted that. And he said it's a hindrance for Gentile believers coming to the faith and so on, and he wouldn't have anything to do with it. But this is a different reason that he gets Timothy circumcised. He's saying there's no reason, you know, that he has to, that this has to be done, except that he's willing, and obviously Timothy was willing, so that he would be able to come and minister among the Gentile people. And so Paul shows that it's the message of the gospel which is really important, not the cultural restrictions imposed by various groups. And it's a great lesson to us because we can so often become embedded in our own culture and subcultures uh, that 
they take precedence over the gospel. And the question, I suppose, that he asks of us is, what are we willing to do? Uh, in, and how are we willing to change that we may be able to share the gospel unhindered with others? Are we really willing to accept people as they are, not as we want them to be? People who are entirely different to us, people who think differently, come from different cultures and have different ways about them. Do we, you know, are we happy not to expect them to be like us? And how are we willing to change? There's been many examples of people who have managed uh, to cut themselves free from the cultural worlds that they were born into and uh, to make massive changes so that they could go and share the gospel. And there's many well-known stories of missionaries who went to China and India and various other places and changed their cultures, the cultures that they had been brought up in. And, and, and how they thought so that they could freely share the gospel. But because of the week that's in it, I wanted to share the story of an Irish guy. And uh, the guy uh, is a guy called Edward Nangle. And he was known as the Ackle Irish uh, missionary. And in the 19th century, the early 19th century, um, he set up a mission on the um, island of Ackle in the west of Ireland, just off the Mayo coast. And Nangle was a Church of Ireland uh, clergyman, and he came from an influential Protestant family who'd been the barons of Navan for over 600 years. And he really felt from God that after a visit to Ackle that he should go and found a missionary colony there. And he moved there to live there permanently for some years. But this guy who was a, a, a Protestant uh, a minister, very much from the, the ascendancy in Ireland, the Protestant ascendancy, he left his culture behind him and he learned to speak Irish fluently so that he would be able to speak to the people on the Ackle uh, Island. And he went there and he, he received a lot of criticism both within the Church of Ireland and from the Catholic Church who were totally opposed to what he was doing, as you can imagine. And um, even after his death, he was a somewhat controversial figure. But during the Great Famine of the, 19, of the 1840s, uh, and even though Nangle thought the famine was God's judgment on Ireland uh, because the British government had sponsored uh, a Catholic seminary in Maynooth, and for some odd reason, Nangle thought that this was... Uh, the judgment, God's judgment on Ireland, even though he thought that, he, he went out for the people of Ackle. And his mission employed over 2,000 people and was feeding 600 people per day in mission schools. By 1848, at the height of the famine, it was estimated that his mission was feeding 5,000 of the 7,000 residents on uh, Ackle Island. And he was, he was quite forward-thinking, and he, he, he went and he got um, potatoes that had no blight, imported them into Ireland, 21 tonnes of them, and planted them in Ackle, that there would be sustainable food for the people there for some years to come. And so, for all sorts of reasons, the mission on the island declined and was gone by the 1880s. But Nangle had been like Joseph in Egypt um, all those years before. He was a man uh, of his time and for a time. And while he was there, he saved the people of Ackle during the Great Famine. And thousands and thousands of people, um, I believe, are still alive and families are still in existence today because of uh, what Nangle was prepared to do. And the reason I share that story, of course, is that he was prepared to leave his own culture to embrace a new culture, to learn Irish and so on, so that he could share the gospel with uh, the people that God had sent him to. And so Paul's words, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible, possible means I may save some, speak to us today. Now, those words have often been misinterpreted and misused. Paul's clearly not saying, look, I've become a thief 
so that I can save thieves or I've become an adulterer so that I can speak to adulterers. He wasn't talking about embracing a lifestyle that wasn't right. This is about culture and about actually giving up some of the cultural heritage even that he had so, to share the gospel. The other thing as well is that I think that these Paul's words have sometimes been used by people to dilute the message. And there's a kind of a feeling out there, often throughout generations, where we feel that in order to get into the mindset of the generation that we're in, that we have to embrace maybe the morals of that generation or the zeitgeist, the thought of the generation. And I think that that's a very dangerous thing to do because it leads to a lot of compromise. Um, and while we, and in doing that, I think we can completely lose the message that it is that we're trying to share. And so Paul changed himself so that he could share the message with the people, but he wasn't prepared to change the message. And I think that that's important that we uh, know that. He didn't get into the groove with the Corinthians who were living a hedonistic lifestyle of pleasure. In fact, he was quite countercultural and talked against what they were doing. Um, the preeminent goal in his life was to see people brought into the kingdom. And I believe that's a real challenge to us. It asks us the question what is the preeminent goal in our lives? What is it that we really, really want? What do we reach out for? What are we really going for? Paul gives the Corinthians then uh, an example from a scene that they all would have been with, uh, really familiar with. Like the Irish, the Corinthians, well, the Greeks, uh, the whole lot of them, were all mad into sport. And uh, they didn't play rugby at the time or soccer, but they had quite a few sports uh, that they were involved with. And at the time um, that Paul was living in uh, Corinth and then writing to them later, the um, Isthmian Games were held uh, on the Isthmus of uh, Corinth. And it was a huge event, massive event. The game started about 600 years uh, before the time of Christ and land lasted into the 4th century. So they were you know, they were there a very long time. And through thick and thin, these games existed. Um, they existed before the Romans ever got there. And um, I, I found it fascinating that the Greeks, when they were fighting with, with each other, if you know anything about Greek history, you'll know there was little Greek states. Uh, there was a thousand of them at one time. And so each of the cities was its own little state. And so states like Athens and Sparta and Corinth, they were always fighting with each other. And in the middle of a war once between Corinth and Athens who were fighting, um, they stopped the war for the games. And the Athenians who came to Corinth for the games were treated really well. Some of them won competitions and then they went off and then they started fighting with each other again. That's how important these games were to them. And when the Romans arrived and completely obliterated Corinth um, before Julius Caesar rebuilt it, um, even then, the games went on, even though the city of Corinth went, wasn't there. People used to arrive, set up tents, and um, the games would go on every two years. The Olympics were on every four years in Olympia, and the Isthmian games were on every two years. The Olympics were dedicated to Zeus, to Zeus, and the uh, Isthmian games to Poseidon. And um, mainly it was Greeks that were... Um, allowed to, only Greeks originally that were allowed to enter the games but then when the Romans uh, rebuilt uh, Corinth and they, they were part of the Roman Empire Roman citizens were also allowed to take part the winners received a, uh, a wreath of celery originally but by uh, Roman times that had changed to pine leaves and you know those who took part the athletes in these games uh, apart from getting just a wreath, actually, they were treated with great honour. And there was absolute superstars of the time. And we even know some of their names still. And um, while, 
you know, we might have the thought that they were all just amateur athletes who kind of came along and went, you know, ran in the games or did whatever they did and went off again. That's not strictly true. It would appear that actually some of them were professional athletes. That's pretty much all they did. They trained all year for the games. We know that the Athenians were so keen to win that they actually paid their uh, winners 100 drachmas. So if you think um, a drachma, one drachma a day was the average industrial wage, they got paid 100 drachmas, a, a third of a year's wages uh, for winning a title. And so um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was big business. And uh, the other thing as well is it was, it was often corrupt as well. And um, judges were bribed, even though it was uh, prohibited by law. And so it was very, very competitive. Anyway, there was all sorts of events. And uh, one of the big ones was chariot racing, um, for which this massive stadium was built. And um, 40, 50,000 people used to go and watch the chariot racing. It was a bit like Formula One in the 1950s and 60s. Nearly every race, somebody was killed. There was rex wrestling, boxing, and pancreaton, which was pancreaton, which was like today's MMA. That's mixed martial arts fighting. Conor McGregor, the Irish star, that's what uh, he's involved with. If Conor had been around at the time and he had been Greek or Roman, he would have been a big, big star. In fact, in one famous bout in the Olympics, there was an athlete called Articlon who was defending his title. And he was uh, suffocated during the fight and he died. But not before being declared the victor because the other guy was in so much pain he had conceded. And so the judge um, called the fight for Articlon, but uh, when the other guy got off him, uh, it transpired that he was dead. So, um, and there was men, men, only men were allowed to take part in all these various events, but they did have singing and poetry competitions also for which, uh, in which women were allowed to take part. So I tell you all that about the games before we read the next part of what uh, Paul has to say to us. Um, Paul reminds the people who, he says, you know, dedicate your life, give your life to serving Christ for the gospel. And he says, though, do it in a way like the athletes at the games. And he gives them as an example, as a way to live. And so we're reading from verse 24. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I my, myself might be disqualified. Or as the NIV puts it, I make my body a, like a slave. Everyone knew you didn't enter into the games without training. It's like, the, it's like any professional sport today or any sport really at all. If you want to win uh, the race, you know that you've got to be well trained, you've got to get out there early in the morning and do all the training. And we, we find out um, at the time, you know, professional athletes at that time, they did massive amount of training, they had uh, dietary regimes, they had uh, masseuses who worked with them and so on. So it was, a, it was a big deal. And so you could be the laughing stock if you entered a race and you, were, you, know, you ended up miles behind everybody else. And you certainly didn't enter into a boxing ring or uh, to do the uh, pancreas fighting unless you were extremely well trained and experienced. Because to do so could be suicide. Uh, the boxing they did at the time, they just wound leather around their, uh, their fists and they fought with each other. But there was no three-minute uh, bouts uh, or rounds uh, and, and, you know, and ten-round bouts or anything like that. There was no headgear. They just boxed the head off each other until somebody collapsed or they conceded the fight. And the fight could go on for hours. 
And even the champions died, as I said earlier on. You might remember last week that when, uh, if, if you were watching the service last week, I was talking to Robbie Burns, who said that one of the things he likes to do is to cycle, and that he went and uh, cycled on one of the stages of the Tour de France on his holidays. And I said, I thought that was a kind of a crazy thing to do. But he said, you wouldn't go and do it without training first. And that was the point that Paul is making here. You wouldn't go and do all these things without putting your body into training. And as he said, the, the athletes entered the race or whatever it was, competition that they were taking part of, with one goal in mind. And that was to win the garland of celery or pine leaves and the honour that came with it. And he said this was such a big deal. People dedicated their whole lives to doing this. But he says, you know, the prize only lasted a very short time. In fairness, um, a, garland, a garland of any type of leaves would soon be rotten. He said, though, the race that we're running in, the prize is eternal. It is everlasting. Paul is using the games, the Isthmian games, as an, an analogy. The athletes don't run around for just for the crack or to get a suntan. They're totally dedicated to the prize. He said the boxer or the fighter doesn't ha he's not just waving his hands around in the air. He has them ready to fight all the time to go. The athletes that go into training only do so after the culmination, the race is the culmination of months and months of training and of self-sacrifice. You have to stay trim and deny themselves the pleasures so the pleasures of the world so that they could win the prize. When you think about it, in the context of what we have been talking about over the past few weeks of spiritual maturity, Paul is telling the Corinthian believers that they have to take the Christian life seriously like athletes take running seriously. The athletes run or fight in, to honour the false gods of Zeus at the Olympics or Poseidon at the Isthmian Games. But he tells the Corinthians, you know, your lives are dedicated to the one true God. And that means that some of the rights you possess have to be sacrificed, just as the athletes sacrifice to train their bodies for action. Tom Wright in his commentary says that, well, the message was about as popular in Corinth at that time as it is today in our world. That is, not popular at all. Much of Western culture today is about declaring your rights, the rights of the individual. Do whatever makes you feel good. Enjoy yourself. Go on. You know you deserve it. Think of all the advertising that is around us that keeps on passing on that message. The message of self-denial is not a popular one. However, it's a necessary one for the church to embrace. Maybe never more than today, where the outside looks into our world, unafraid to criticize, picking up everything that is not authentic and real. How we spend our time, our money, and who we spend them with are important. For some of this message, for some of us, this message should lead us out of our holy huddles, where we spend all our time with other Christians, so that we can engage with the whole world out there, so that the cultural norms we are used to, we're prepared to break, to be with those who are different to us, as Paul encourages us to do. For others, this message means that we need to be a bit harder on ourselves so that we can become effective Christians running straight for the prize. Can you think of something that's slowing you down? Something maybe that is like a pack of stones on your back as you, if, if you were going to be running in a race and you had a pack of stones on your back. If there's something that is slowing you down that much, maybe today is the day that you decide to let it drop from your life 
so that you can run faster. Amen.
worthy of every song you could ever sing. We live for you. And there are fantastic words in that uh, worship song. So I'm now joined by Cliff. Say hi, Cliff. Hi, Cliff. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, and we're going to, Cliff's going to lead us in prayer in a minute. But first we're going to go to the Church and Chain videos, and, uh, which we always do as part of Lent. For those of you who are watching these things, um, you'll see that we actually omitted the uh, video for last week. So that's why there's two this week, because we don't want to forget anybody that we're praying for. So we'll be back to you in a few minutes. During week four of Church and Chains' Lent prayer project, we're praying for Yusuf Nadarkani, who's a leader of the Church of Iran House Church Network. He's been in prison since 2018 and is serving a six-year sentence. Yusuf was born into a Muslim family and became a Christian at the age of 19. He's been in prison before. He previously spent three years in prison under sentence of death for apostasy before he was acquitted and released back in 2012. This current prison sentence came after he was arrested in a raid on a house church meeting. Yusuf looks after 11 other members of his church who are in prison with him. Yusuf and his wife Tina have two teenage sons, Daniel and Joel. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to keep Yusuf safe and well in prison, and we pray that he would be given early release. Please bless and sustain Tina, Daniel and Joel. We ask you to bless and protect Iran's house churches. Amen. In week five of the Church in Chains Lent prayer project, we're praying for Dr. Tekliab Mengistiab, who has been in prison in Eritrea for the past 16 years. Dr. Tekliab, who is aged 57, is an Eritrean Orthodox priest and physician who was arrested in 2004 because of his involvement in the Bible study renewal movement within the Orthodox Church. The government of Eritrea is deeply suspicious of Christians and has imprisoned hundreds of Christians without charge or trial. Dr. Tekliab is being held in the maximum security Wengel Mermera prison in the capital Asmara, where he's believed to be in a cell with six other Christian leaders. He has no contact with his family who live outside Eritrea, but it is believed that he is receiving regular insulin to deal with his diabetes. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to strengthen and encourage Dr. Tekliab and his friends in Wengel Marmara prison, and we pray for their release. We ask you to protect Dr. Tekliab's health and to give his wife and three daughters hope. Amen. So Cliff, you're going to pray with us today. How's life treating you for starters? Treating me very well. We're get, yes, we're getting on very well. We manage to keep ourselves busy, Good. which is what it's all about, and getting out for a walk every day, Lovely. which is not something I was doing before COVID came along. Were you not? No, I was not. So uh, my life has changed dramatically because of that. For the better? Oh, absolutely for the better, really? yes. And you never looked like you had a pound on you that you didn't, uh, well, that you didn't need, you know? That's just me. Well, I wish I was just like that too. Anyway, it's great to see you. Please lead us in prayer. Today, I want to use my hand to lead us through prayer. First of all, the thumb, which is closest to us, reminds us of our families, those close to us, our husband, our wife, our partner, our children, our parents, grandparents, our siblings. Father, we thank you for these people. We thank you, Father, for uh, the people you have given us in our family, the people who care for us, and the people we care for as well. Father, we thank you too that during this time uh, when some of us have been locked away, so to speak, in our own houses or apartments or wherever we live, that you have given us the grace to be able to get through these things. Father, we pray that for those people who may be still in, in, uh, stuck indoors because of COVID or those who 
maybe families who have parents working at home or children uh, maybe still doing school, homeschooling, that you will give patience or extra patience needed because of the way people are thrust together in, in an unnatural way for so long. Father, we remember the talks which Ross has been given about uh, mental health and we ask that we be able to put these tips that he has given us into practice. The next finger is our index finger and that reminds us of those who guide us in our lives. We think of the Gardaí, we think of the leaders of our church, we think of, uh, we think of our bosses at work, uh, maybe our college lecturers or school teachers. And we also think too here of the, uh, we want to remember the healthcare workers and carers. We thank you for these people, Father, for the way you have given them this charge and for all during this time, some of them have been working so hard all during this COVID time. And we ask that any particular, any of them who are particularly uh, tired or just worn out, that you will give them rest at this time, Father. Just be with each one of them as they have need. Our next finger is the tallest finger. <clears throat> and we remember those, uh, we remember the president of Ireland and our government, and we add in Neffet here as well. We ask you to just to guide them in the decisions which they have to make, not just about the coronavirus and vaccinations and so on, but also about the economy and uh, all the decisions that are, need to be made to try and get the economy back on track again. We remember those people who maybe have lost businesses and those who have maybe lost their jobs or have cut, who, whose pay has been cut. Just be with these people, Father, give them guidance as to how to proceed and provide for them. We just thank you, Father. Our next finger is the weakest finger in our hand. And we remember those <coughs> who are known to us who are sick, those who are in hospital, in nursing homes. We remember the elderly. We remember those who are mourning. Father, this is a particularly difficult time when we, if somebody we know, somebody we care about has died and so few people are allowed to attend a funeral, which is so unnatural for us here, Father. Father, we ask for you, wrap, you wrap your arms around these people. Just care for them in an extra special way. Father, those people who are in nursing homes and in hospital, uh, we ask, and those even who are at home who are not well, we ask that you bring back good, full health again for these people. And we thank you for the carers who, who look after them too, Father. The last finger is the smallest finger. And that reminds us of ourselves. It reminds us of uh, <clears throat> that you provide for us, that you look after us. And anybody who, any of us who are not well, Father, we ask for good health, you to bring us back to full health again. Thank you, Father, for um, just being with us. And we I thank you, Father, for, as I mentioned earlier, that I'm able to get out for walks and for the way we have discovered just maybe a peace in, in our lives which wasn't there before because we were so busy living and rushing around that now we can just be still and enjoy nature and listen to the bird song. We thank you for this, Father. And this it reminds me, Lord, of the last couple of, phrase, of verses in the 23rd Psalm. You, Lord, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So thanks, Cliff. And um, yeah, thanks for praying that. I, I think it's, it's, it's so true, you know, that we find peace. Many of us have found more peace in the middle of uh, this uh, pandemic in terms of spending more time with families, more time at home, not rushing to meetings in the evening and all that sort of thing. And certainly that's been my experience. Well, I think it, for a lot of us, it's turned our lives topsy-turvy, upside yeah, down, yeah. and forced us to reevaluate <clears throat> what is important in our lives and uh, to get rid, rid of some of the things which aren't important. Sure. It will be very interesting that when all this is over and we get back we get to a new normal, what things we won't be doing anymore yeah. and maybe what new things we will be putting in in place of them. Absolutely true. I think we'll have to be very careful not to go rushing back to where, to where we were doing all the bad things, you know. But I think it will be one of the things we will find is relationships 
uh, will be a very important thing in the future, particularly relationships within families, yeah. that we care for each other, we care for our neighbours, our relatives, uh, a lot more than in the past, yeah. uh, and, or that has been obvious in the past, but that that's something which I think will just be more important to us, yeah. have a higher priority in our lives Super. in the future. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Yes, it is. Mm. Yes, it is. So thanks very much to Cliff for being with us. Thanks to Ross for earlier and to Megs and uh, those who do music. And uh, we're hoping to record some new stuff uh, soon enough for Easter. Um, so thanks for being with us this morning. And um, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed uh, listening and that you are participating and that also that God has spoken to you this morning and uh, that you have heard his voice. And so um, we pray for you peace and joy and safety and see you again next time bye bye